Dordic Studio welcomes you all here this evening and I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Stephen Crafty. I started my writing career by uh, living in a great uh, modernist 1950s house in North Baldwin, designed by Montgomery, King and Trengo. So really from the early 90s to the end of the 90s, I literally interviewed every post-war architect I could get close to. So John and Phyllis Murphy, uh, Neil Clarahan, who died recently, I mean all the greats. Um, and so that just helped my, uh, my knowledge bank going forward. And so really for, for the, most of the 90s, I was talking about the 50s. And then it got to the point that people saw me as the 50s man. But getting back to the 50s, when I saw this house to start with, I thought it was kind of a, I couldn't get it because I thought this isn't a Fuchs house. Um, and I really was quite stumped. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a late 40s, mid 40s, waterfall style house, as you can see, brick. And really, George um, Smorgan commissioned this, this room. So uh, that's, when I got that, and because I was so confused, I actually reached out to Professor Alan Pert at Melbourne University. And I said, look, I'm a bit confused about this house. I'm normally, I mean, my wife's grandmother lived in a, an Ernest Fuchs house. I know his work. Um, I know I knew Noemi uh, Fuchs very, very well and had written on her house in Howard Road with that lovely curved uh, roof. So I just thought this isn't it. Um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't reconcile the two. And it was only when I, I, I spoke to Alan and got some information, I realized, ah, oh, I did an extension. So this is quite unusual to have this format uh, in really is what a, a waterfall style house. So, as you know, there's, there's four muses here, the Greek goddesses, one's um, poetry, one's philosophy, one's drama, and one is music. And originally, starting with the mural, it was originally going to go to the ground. And then um, it's not quite clear who commissioned this piece of furniture. Uh, it's by Sean Crimper, obviously, but whether it was George or whether it was uh, Ernest Fuchs, um, it's not quite clear who started that process. But as pointed out to me when I first arrived a bit earlier today, um, if you notice, um, the, because it was meant to be uh, full height, uh, the, the sideboard's been kind of cut into the actual tile wall. That's amazing detail. And if you also notice, because the first muse was going to go to the floor, he was going to be the height, was the height. That was the original height, but when it was decided for this piece of work in, then the others were reduced in scale. As far as I know, there's very few uh, examples of this type of work anywhere in a domestic environment. It's quite extraordinary. Um, I believe there was another one that was demolished. Um, this one is still uh, in original condition. Um, I also bought, I mean, I've been following Shulman Krimper's work for a long time. And um, he was an emigre, like, um, like the Daldi. I did a book on people's collections a few years ago, and in it you'll see it. There's one, one guy in particular, so it contains art collections, furniture, um, I'll pass that in. And um, if you look at the Krimper collection, there's one guy who lives in Turak who's, who's obsessed with Krimper, and he's got houses filled with Krimper. He's got it under his bed. He's got a separate <laughs> apartment full of crimper. If there's anything at Leonard Joel that goes uh, by the name of crimper, forget it. There was one young man who came in and he saw a little cabinet, a tiny little cabinet, um, a bedside table. He said, I'd really, and he's a, um, a, crafts, a craftsman, and he said, oh, I'd really love, um, I'd love to get that sideboard. I said, you won't get it. He's in the room. And for this little, little sideboard, it wasn't, it was tiny, it was 6,000. So um, Crimper's very, very valuable now. He's represented in major museums. Um, pe you know, there was people who worked with Crimper. He was more like an artist or an, an architect. He used to wear a smock 
Occasionally he would wear a monocle, um, <laughs> and he was very meticulous. And so to have Primper in your house was really quite an achievement. Um, we have Zurov at home. He's kind of the next tier down. So um, he's getting up in price, but Crimp is the one to really go for. And he used wonderful um, timbers like Black Bean and Queensland timbers. Um, if you knew a bit about Ernest Fuchs and Noemi, they, and you have actually had the privilege of going to their house, you would notice that uh, they travelled the world. And, you know, she loved collecting um, objects and artefacts from uh, Japan, Europe, South America. And I remember we photographed the house for Wallpaper magazine. This was many years ago. And she, ring, she rang me, Naomi rang me. She said, oh, she was really upset. And she said, they've just stripped the house of everything. And it's just not my house anymore. And she was furious. And I was cross as well. Because I actually think it should be about the people who live in the house, not strip it out just for the sh for, to make things look groovy and slick. You know, I think it deserves more. So it's lovely to come into a room like this with the original parquetry flooring, the perforated ceiling for um, sound acoustics, and this television cabinet that's kind of uh, quite extensive. And this would have been an area for the speaker. Now you can just access drawers. Um, but everything's beautifully detailed. I mean, um, you know, he was a perfectionist. And um, he is, I mean, look, crimp has been expensive for years, but it just keeps going up and up and up. And uh, I don't know what this guy who's got this crimper collection, which would really go into the hundreds, what he's going to do with it uh, eventually. So, um, um, so as I said, this is a reasonably modest uh, extension. Um, I think what's interesting is the combination of things coming together. So you've got Dr. Ernest Fuchs, you've got the Daldigs, um, and you've got Crimper. So that's, I think the Daldig mural is just kind of brings it up another level and you go, oh my God. Um, I think that's what's lovely about architecture and design. It offers surprises and I haven't seen this three components come together. The photography is also by Wolfgang Sievers, so he's a fourth person who comes into this production, if you like. Um, uh, so I think that's, that's another part of it. Um, as mentioned by uh, Janine, uh, they were both, the Doldings were both artists and they trained in Vienna and um, uh, Karlswald Slava uh, invented this foldable umbrella and uh, it was she painted patented it before she left uh, to flee the Nazis and um, unfortunately once she left all the royalties went to the company that actually produced the umbrella which was quite sad but they were both accomplished artists um, so I, I think it's just interesting having um, this the three come or the four with Wolfgang Sievers come together um, um, look, I'm an absolute purist. I think when you have things like this, you really have to hold on to them. And, um, and look, this isn't heritage protected, obviously, but it would be absolutely uh, a tragedy if someone came in. And that's the worry with architecture and design today. Uh, you know, you see magical things and you just hope that the people who come in actually really um, understand it. And even if you don't understand it, do your research first before you make any decisions. I think with anyone, whether you're an architect or an interior designer, rather than coming in and saying, I have a vision, <laughs> you know, why don't you do the research first and find out exactly what's in a house before you go to the next stage? I mean, uh, there's heritage architects in this room and they will do their research before they make their next move. Unfortunately, we don't seem to value architecture and design to the way it should be uh, in, the, in the same way we should be uh, valuing it. And, you know, I've seen just absolute uh, tragedies and it's very difficult to restore things. I mean, once you remove something like this crimper or, you know, you just can't get it back. And um, it just looks corny. I mean, my own house in North Bourne, 
uh, which was uh, a museum, basically. It was four levels. It was done to museum standards, and I was incredibly finicky. I mean, even the, um, the uh, inside of the cupboards was done with a certain uh, covering in the 50s spirit. And the owners bought it from us and said, oh, we love everything, we love everything. They ripped it to shreds. I was furious. It was featured in The Guardian, in The Weekend Guardian in London, in books, in magazines. Oh, we love it, we love it. And funnily enough, I just had a call from an architect recently, and he said, oh, Stephen, I've just got a call from the owners of your house. And I was kind of, you know, I was kind of quite taken back. And uh, they want to go back to the 50s. <laughs> so they've damaged the whole house, they ripped out the floating staircase, and now they want to go back to the 50s. And he was the man. And apparently, and he said to me, and I, I'm almost choked, he said, there's so, there's so few architects and designers um, out there who are interested in mid-century, they're so lucky they got me. I said, I beg your pardon. I said, it hasn't, it's not a secret. I was writing about post-war design in the 90s, and really every second architect and designer now kind of gets it. I mean, you know, if I said to you, look, the 90s is coming back, you'd say, well, I haven't seen evidence of that. But post-war architect is very strong in Melbourne. Um, the Fiona Austin from the, the Morris Group has been very active in more recent times. Um, and so it's not a secret. And so when people say, you know, we're so lucky to have you, no. You know. So look, I think we're lucky to be here today. I feel very honoured to be in this house. Um, I, you know, I mean, you know when, you, when you're um, in a space that's very special. So I thank the owners, Keith and your partner, um, the Doldy Foundation for inviting me, uh, Julie and um, Janine, who, um, and, and really for people attending tonight because it is a really good cause. And, um, and I, I hopefully, you know, I live long enough to the next 20 years that I'll be able to visit this place and say, oh, I remember talking in front of this in 2022. And how lucky we were we. So thank you. Thank you.